Hello and welcome to the Fiber Tales podcast. My name is Lerke and this is a special episode all about yarn choice. Normally I do podcasts on this channel, but today's episode won't have the regular content where I show you what I've been knitting and so on. Uh, today is all about my thoughts on yarn choice. Uh, a few things I want to say before we get started is that these are my opinions. Um, this is my experience and what I have learned working a lot with yarn as a knitwear designer and also just as a knitter for many years. I'm not an expert, I don't know everything and I might say something wrong or you might not agree with what I say, but these are my opinions. Um, also, a little disclaimer before I begin, some of these yarns have been given to me for collaborations, uh, for designs. They're all yarns I had lying around my house. Uh, but as I work as a knitwear designer, I have a lot of yarn that I got sent for free to for when I was working on designs. Um, I just picked whatever I had in my house. Uh, some of them I bought with my own money. Some of them I've been sent. I just wanted to mention that I'm not going to say every time that something is uh, gifted just because this video is not sponsored and I am not, um, I don't think it's important, but I will link it down below because of course you need to know when I'm talking about something that has been gifted to me. Um, I also want to say that if you're interested in anything that I mentioned, I will put links uh, whenever I know of a good uh, blog post or a good video that talks about the same, for example, when I will talk about superwash yarns, I know some, um, I have some sources that I can put down below. So if you're interested, try to look in the, in the um, show notes. Uh, I will try to link everything I talk about. There's a lot. Um, and this video will be like, I will try to, to touch on everything, which means I cannot go super much in depth on every little thing um, but I will try to walk you through the different aspects you have to keep in mind when picking yarn for a project and I think choosing the right yarn can be super important because it can mean that you will love the finished object or you will never wear it if you pick a yarn that you don't like wearing it's itchy or it's too fluffy or for some reason it's too warm or too cold it might mean that you never wear it so it can, let's say, make or break your finished object in the sense that it can become a wardrobe staple or it can never be worn. Um, so knowing yarn and knowing what to use is very important. That said, it took me many years to get to this point and I don't think, even if I can try to explain you everything, a lot of it has to come from your own experience. So yarn is very tactile. I can only tell you what I think but you will have to play a lot with play with a lot of yarns, knit some garments that might never be worn. But I hope knowing a bit more about it can help you pick the right ones or have a better chance of picking the right ones. Um, and again, it's very individual. What I like, you might not might not like. Um, so we're going to go through. Uh, I've tried to put everything into sections. So I will talk about different types of yarn first. Then I will talk about fiber content. Then I will move on to, um, sorry, let me just check. Uh, then I will move on to things you have to consider when you are picking yarn for a project. And lastly, I will go more into depth on ethical choice when picking yarn, because I think that's very important. And for me, that's a huge part of uh, what I take into consideration when picking a yarn. I will try to put timestamps down below so you can skip to any section you want to skip to um, and yeah I hope I remember everything because there's a lot to talk about but I think it's a super exciting and interesting topic so I will try to do it justice. The first thing is uh, types of yarn and I will start talking about um, yarn weights. So when talking about yarn weights for me, actually, it took me many years to really understand what it was all about, because in Denmark, where I'm from, you don't work with the term or work with yarn weights. Uh, you pretty much just work with what needle size is recommended. 
and then you also um, look at the yardage, which is also important. But I think yarn weights is a very nice way to just have an idea what you are going for. Um, so I have this basket full of yarns uh, with different weights and I'm going to try to walk you through the different weights um, so you have an idea. The first one I'm going to talk about is lace weight yarn. As you can see here, the thread is very fine. Uh, lace weight is often used for lacy shawls. That's why it's called lace weight, I imagine. It is uh, good to hold double with other yarns or with itself to, um, to make it thicker. Um, and it has a really high meterage. Um, I'm going to try to put the meterage on the screen so I don't say anything wrong because me and numbers, it's always, yeah, that's always a struggle. Um, or yardage. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a very fine yarn and silk mohair, for instance, has been very popular to hold together with other yarns to give it a bit more softness and a bit of fluff. As you can see, it is very fluffy, very... Some people don't like it, um, some people do. I know you can also get uh, alpaca, um, like spun in the same way, like a Surrey alpaca. So that was the lace weight. It doesn't have to be mohair. That's just what I had on hand. I don't have much lace weight yarn. I don't tend to work a lot with the lace weights because it's very small needles or, for example, I hold it together with other yarns. Then the next category is um, fingering weight yarn or light fingering weight yarn. Actually, I have a light fingering weight. I wanted to show you first. So just remove the basket. This is a light fingering weight. Um, this is from Gull. It's their number four. It's uh, It has 650 meters per 100 grams, this one. And it is almost a lace weight. So let's see if you can see. It's very thin. Um, and again, it's something you would probably hold double uh, unless you want something very airy and drapey. Then I have a fingering weight yarn. This is uh, again from Geul. I have a lot of their bases, so they are very easy to pick up and show you. And this one, as you maybe can see here, it's a little bit thicker, a little bit plumper. Um, now this is a, a, a highland wool, so it's, it is a little bit plumper than the other one I showed you, the one, the light fingering is a merino Gotland mix, so it has a bit of different texture. Again, I will go into all the mixes, all the fiber contents later. This is just to show you a bit of the thickness. Now this one, I think I would say is a sport weight. This is the alpaca base. Um, it's pretty much the same. The sport weight is the next one. It's a little bit thicker than the fingering weight, um, but very, very similar. After sport weight comes DK weight. So DK means, there you go, DK means double knitting. And it is pretty much, if you imagine taking two strands of fingering weight, you get a DK weight yarn. If you go to focus, there you go. Um, and DK weight is quite common, commonly used, the same as fingering weight yarn. Then the next one is the um, worsted weight. Worsted weight, it knits up fairly quickly. Uh, this is from Sneldon uh, and this is a very nice worsted. Let me see if I can show you the strands a bit better. So again, it's it just keeps getting thicker, the yarn. That's the the idea behind the weight. But while it gets uh, thicker, the, the yardage also gets smaller. So because we weight the yarn in 100 grams. So for the same amount of, you have more yarn in the thread, and that means you get less yardage. And for the, I think, I'm not quite sure what this is, but I just wanted to show you this one is probably like a um, DK or a 
Aaron. I think this one is an Aaron. Um, and this is a single ply. And here I have another Aaron just to show you. This is, then we're talking about a lot thicker yarn. And um, then the next one would be bulky or uh, and chunky. And I don't really use that very much. I find it very hard on my hands to work with. Uh, it looks very nice and squishy and comfortable when you are looking at a project uh, knit in bulky or chunky yarn. But for me, it is very hard for my hands because it's often knit on big needles. Um, but more about that a bit later. So these were all the yarns I, uh, I have to show you the yarn weights. So as you could see, if you go from the, from the finest to this is the lace weight that is very thin up to the Aaron. It really likes to focus on my face, but there you go. You can see there's a big difference. And as I said, for 100 grams, you get less and less and less yardage when you go from lace weight up to Aaron weight or chunky or something like that. So you always have to keep that in mind. You cannot just go for, I need 400 grams for a sweater. That doesn't work unless you know you need 400 grams of fingering weight yarn or uh, 400 grams of uh, DK weight. It's a very different, you have to always look at, of course, if you're working from a pattern, you look on the recommended yardage because it depends on the weight of yarn you're using. When deciding on what kind of weight you want for a project, of course, if you're knitting from a pattern, you should just go with what the pattern recommends. So the pattern will recommend a weight of yarn, often if it's an international pattern, or it will recommend a yarn um, to use and then tell you how many balls. So if you want to substitute that, you just have to go and see the recommended yarns. How many meters does it have per 100 grams? And then, or yards. And then you can go and see on the yarn, yarn yarn you want, wish to use, uh, how many meters it has, or if it says in the pattern what yarn weight it is, you can try to look for similar yarn weight. So for example, on this ball band, you can see that it says 100 grams equals 650 meters, and it says light fingering. So you can either you look for a yarn with a similar meterage per 100 grams and be careful because sometimes it says also per 50 grams uh, and then you can look at the then you can look at the um, at the weight so that's a way if you want to substitute you can try to look at the yarn itself um, if you don't know the weight of the yarn, for example, as I said, many Danish yarn brands don't use weights. I recommend going to a Ravelry, search for the yarn you want to use, and then on Ravelry they almost always say the yarn weight. Uh, so that's very helpful. And you can also go and see, uh, for example, if you have a pattern that you want to use and you want to substitute um, or maybe you want to try to do it with a DK, even if it says worsted, then try to go and see in projects what other people used and you can see how it turns out if you use a different weight. Now using a different uh, yarn weight can be a bit um, tricky. Uh, you also have to look on the needle size. So when talking about needle size and yarn weight, we also talk about gauge. Gauge is when you measure how many stitches you have per 10 centimeters and um, both in width and in height. So you take like a little square of 10 centimeters or four inches per four inches, and then you know how many stitches you have. Um, yeah, how many centimeters, how many stitches you have per one centimeter of one inch, and how many rows you have again per one centimeter one inch. And that is how the designer calculates the pattern. So if you want to use a different yarn weight, what can happen is you can get a more airy fabric. So let's say I want to substitute a fingering weight yarn like this with a light fingering weight yarn. What will happen is I get a lighter fabric with, it's gonna be more see-through. If instead I want to substitute 
the uh, fingering weight with uh, sorry I have it all on the floor if you want to substitute the fingering weight with a DK weight for example you will get a much more dense fabric which might work out but you might not like the fabric so the designer has chosen a fabric they think work with the design but you might be fine with that so you have to really think if you use a different uh, weight of yarn or thickness of yarn you have to pay attention to whether or not you like the fabric that's why you do a gauge swatch and also the swatch is to get to know the fabric but also to see if your gauge is on point if it's not on point that's when you decide to go up or down needle sizes now this is a totally different topic and i won't get into it here i'm planning to make another video about swatching and needle size and all of that but it is things you have to take into consideration together with the yarn choice so you can switch out yarns but you just have to keep in mind what will happen if you switch out yarn the next thing to keep in mind when talking about types of yarn is the way the yarn is spun that also is important um, when talking about the finished fabric you will get so there are many type ways of spinning but basically you can say there are two ways so there is uh, woolen spun and worsted spun I normally work with woolen spuns it's they it's a way of spinning where the fibers are kind of mixed uh, so they are not um, they are pointing in all different directions and that means the yarn will be very lofty it traps air into the when you spin it and let me just show you here you can see like uh, the yarn has this kind of bounce you can feel it when you squish it it's just very it's like a big squishy thing when you touch woolen spun yarns um, when you touch uh, worsted spun yarns all the fibers have been combed to lay in the same direction that means the yarn will look more shiny normally depends because if it's a very woolen yarn it might not have any sheen to it to the fibers but normally it makes the yarn look more shiny and it um, it also makes the yarn more heavy as I said a lot of air has been trapped into the um, woolen spun but with the worsted spun you have to have the, the fibers are much closer together and that means it's a little more heavy so just to give to give you an idea about the difference between worsted and woolen spun this yarn here is a worsted spun it's a John Arburn knit by numbers and I don't know if you can notice it's very nice and woolen but it's uh, now it's been wound into a ball so of course it's a little bit harder but it's just a little more uh, sleek and if you look at this yarn that is uh, Barra Mew uh, I don't know if you can feel a little bit or get the sense of the yarn but it's a little more puffy and this is the same weight uh, but they are both DK weights but they look uh, different so whether you choose a worsted spun or a woolen spun that's just preference um, and depending on how you want normally the uh, worsted spun can give you a cleaner stitch definition and the woolen spun is a little more fussy I think the woolen spun is very nice for color work but both can be used um, it's not said that one is better than the other but those are the things to keep in mind you can have uh, yarns with no plies or many plies now I'm not really an expert on plies um, I just see what I like but let me give you an example of something that is not plied this is the Plotolobi by Istex. It's a um, unspun yarn, which means if I pull this yarn, let me see if I can get it to focus on the yarn again. Yeah, if I pull the yarn, it will simply break. There's no twist in the yarn, so normally the yarn will have some kind of twist. This one doesn't. Um, you can easily work with this yarn, I know it scares a lot of people, but it's a lot of fun to work with. It's just you cannot tension the yarn too uh, hard and you have to 
be a little more loose with your hands when you work with this yarn. Um, you can have two ply, you can have single ply yarns. Um, single ply would be like the unspun, but just with uh, just twisted. When you have two ply, for example, like with this one, if I wind it the opposite way, let me see if I can show you. You can kind of tell that there are two strands rubbing around each other. So that's a two ply and you can have more and more plies. Um, there are different reasons to add in many plies. It can make it stronger and so on. Uh, there's also the type of spinning that is very twisted. So let me see if I can show you. This is the Sunday yarn from Sandness and it has a high twist. So if you look on the strands, you have the twists and they're very tightly wound together. I don't necessarily like this yarn super much, uh, but it's very bouncy and yeah, can be good for some things. Uh, and then another yarn, and there are so many types of yarn, so I can only show you some of the ones I have is this kind of uh, blow yarn. This is from Knitting for Olive. The blow yarn is the double merino. The blow yarn is like a little tube where you blow uh, a fiber into it. Um, and it's also been very popular. It's very soft uh, and lovely and it can be made with different fiber contents. This is just all merino. So there are many uh, kind of um, uh, versions of uh, how you say you can have uh, you can spin yarn in so many ways and there are many art yarns and uh, many companies do crazy spinnings with um, yeah to get different effects and it just depends uh, what you are the look you are going for it's important to keep in mind when choosing the yarn the spinning method or the way the yarn looks uh, if you are interested in a yarn that will show off the pattern really well, so then you want to pick a yarn that is not super busy. If you have a lot of texture or you have uh, color work, it might um, not work if you choose a yarn that is uh, dyed in a very variegated way or that is um, has a lot of little nips like a, a tweed yarn. So you have to think about the way the yarn is spun depending on the the look you want to have. So a more smooth and uniform yarn will show off the stitches very nicely and a more fun and crazy yarn might be really nice for just a plain garment like the one I'm wearing. So you can always, you always have to think about what you want to achieve with the yarn. When talking about types of yarn, it is very important to mention um, the superwash versus non-superwash uh, debate. Um, because I think a lot of people don't really know what is the difference between superwash and non-superwash and why I, for example, always talk about that my yarn is non-superwash and why that is important to me. Um, if we keep the ethical part of superwash versus non-superwash yarn for the last section, I, um, I need to mention the different benefit pros and cons, let's say. Um, for choosing superwash and non-superwash. So superwash yarn, as you can see, I have some here. I rarely use it, but I have some. Um, this is the Yama Fiber Arts uh, Linen Worsted. Um, superwash yarn is, uh, as the name suggests, easy to wash, which means you can normally wash it in the machine. Uh, it can take higher temperatures. It can take a little more um, moving around like it can be touched while it's wet and it won't felt. Uh, what happens with a normal yarn if you wash it and you agitate the yarn and um, you change the temperatures is the yarn will felt and the reason it will felt is because uh, a non-superwash yarn like the Sneldan I have here it is um, it has a lot of little scales on the yarn. The scales um, are what makes the yarn grip onto, like it, you can almost feel it. That's why you sometimes talk about yarn being toothy. They're like little teeth that grips. So one strand of yarn will kind of grip onto the next strand of yarn. They will kind of stick together. Although I don't like the word stick so much because it makes me think of something that's uh, sticky. It doesn't mean the yarn is sticky. It just means they kind of, 
velcros together like a velcro um, like little hooks that will just grab onto each other now these scales you can remove uh, with the superwash treatment and um, the superwash treatment can be done in different ways but generally uh, what you do is you uh, with a acid you remove the scales and then you coat it with a um, plastic coating uh, and again there are different ways of doing it but uh, many superwash yarns are both have both been through an acid wash to remove the scales and then a coating to make it smoother and softer uh, a plastic coating and this process means that the yarn no longer grips onto the strands uh, of yarn as much it becomes much smoother much more drapey so if you can see this one it's quite uh, loose and it's not only it doesn't have to do with how I knit it necessarily so just to give you an example because I have two items that I knit in these two yarns this is uh, the merino linen yarn which is superwash as you can see it has a lot of drape it's like uh, and it's very heavy it's heavy it's drapey it's uh, um, yeah it kind of just falls in on itself if I drop it it will just become this very nice beautiful drapey pile so it looks very pretty uh, if you look on the non superwash shawl here I have um, a shawl knit in Snelden uh, three ply and if you look at it it's still drapey but it's I don't know how to explain it completely it doesn't slide off my hand like this one it's <laughs> very hard to manage um, it's yeah look at the way it moves this one moves a little bit different now it's gonna be fluff all over the air um, yeah it's just and then it at I think the same gauge pretty much um, the fabric is just different so that's one of the difference between a superwash and a non superwash uh, if you take a non superwash yarn as I said, it has these little scales and the scales um, have several benefits to them. It means that they trap air into the yarn and it keeps the body warm. That's why the sheep stay warm. They, ha they trap air into the wool under the scales and it keeps the body warm, um, but it also makes it easier to breathe uh, so the air can cool down or warm up. Also, um, if you go out in the rain with a wool sweater, you will notice that it doesn't, you don't get wet in the same, it doesn't suck the water in. Again, the sheep want to stay warm and dry because it's, it's clothed. So it's a brilliant, genius thing to have a, a nice woolen yarn that is non superwash treated because it just is very natural in the way that it keeps you warm and dry. Of course, if you go out in a completely crazy rainstorm you probably won't stay dry but for the most part it that's what it does the non superwash yarn will uh, suck in the water because there are no more scales and it will also be cooler which is nice because for example my sh I use these two shawls for different uh, occasions so I use the it's big and chunky um, the one from this but it's uh, not as warm as the woolen yarn, um, the woolen scarf. I, um, that is also why, because they remove the scales, that is easier to dye on, an, on a superwash yarn. And that is why many dyers use it. Also, it's, it's harder to felt it <laughs> because when you are hand dyeing yarns, you kind of uh, heat them up, cool them down, wash them and so on. Um, I'm not a dyer, so I'm not going to go too much into that because I don't know too much more about it. Uh, but that's my understanding. It's easier to dye. The, the color goes straight into the fibers and you get more saturated colors with a non superwash yarn than you do if you dye on a... Um, sorry, on a superwash yarn than you do if you dye on a non superwash yarn. Uh, yes, and then I will talk more about why... What are the consequences of the treatment, the superwash treatment. I will talk more about that later. For this next section, uh, I'm going to talk about fiber content. So now we know there are many thicknesses of yarn. There are, you can make many kinds of fabric. 
with different needle sizes and using different uh, yarn weights but the fiber content also plays a huge role into the fabric you will get and into if you will like the yarn or not so the first one i'm going to talk about is wool and that is a big section for me um i prepared another ball of yarn now we have some more colorful yarns uh, and i'm going to try to talk about wool a little bit more i will try to separate wool into two sections so the first section is um, rustic wool and i will talk more about what that means and then soft wool so let's talk about something rustic here we have a, a let lopi you probably all have seen and heard about this this is icelandic wool this is very rustic let me put my basket down um, this is very rustic very um, toothy there we go very rustic very toothy uh, many people will find this itchy scratchy all of that thing this is actually a single ply um, so this yarn uh, is what when i think of itchy yarn i think of a little opi. it's kind of itchy but it's very nice for outerwear so if i should knit anything with a little opi, it would be a big sweater that i can wear on top of other things i would probably never wear a t-shirt under a little opi sweater like a short sleeve t-shirt i would always wear a long sleeve t-shirt and when I was a kid, I wore a lot of sweaters that were itchy and I learned that turtlenecks are really perfect if you like, if you wear itchy sweaters, <laughs> like woolly sweaters. Now, the thing with the itch factor is it seems like something that makes a lot of people nervous uh, because we all have those memories as a child being itchy and so on. I will say if you know you're going to sit still at a computer for half a day, you can easily wear this kind of yarn. Um, because what I find is if you don't get heated up and your body temperature doesn't, like if you start sweating a little bit, it gets way more itchy. So I don't like wearing this kind of yarn when I'm biking or move like busy. But if I'm sitting at a computer, it's the best thing to keep me warm or if I'm yeah working, being more still. So uh, the very rustic, uh, grippy yarn, the Icelandic yarn is like that because it has hairs from the coat of the wool mixed with the um, softer. So some sheep have a overcoat and an undercoat, which means the undercoat is softer. The overcoat is uh, has this longer, more coarse hairs. Um, again, I'm not super much an expert on what sheep has what, uh, but the Icelandic wool is has a lot of these long the stiffer hairs that is normally what we find itchy. That's actually one thing I find itchy when, for example, I wear um, alpaca, but more about that later, because they also have these long staples. So, um, yeah, what other uh, things can we talk about when we talk about the rustic yarn? Not all rustic yarn is itchy, that's one thing. Like this one, I find kind of itchy, but the Sneldon that I showed you before I find very soft. It's very rustic. Um, it's not the kind you would say it's silky soft, but it has. It doesn't have these uh, hairs that itch me. So a way to figure that out is you try to touch your neck. But again, in a skein, it feels different than when it's knit up. So try to make a swatch and wear it uh, on yourself. And if you're not used to rustic yarns, it takes some getting used to as well. But I wear my Snowden shawl all the time, in all weathers, like when it's cold. And I wear it when biking and I get sweaty and it doesn't itch me. So there's different, you can have a very rustic yarn, um, but it doesn't have to be itchy. So that's one thing. You have to look for a yarn that seems very plump and doesn't have a lot of these long hairs sticking out. If you are afraid, you want to figure out if a yarn is itchy or not. Um, but again, it's very individual, so I cannot tell whether you will find something itchy. Um, one thing that's very good about these rustic yarns is they grab together. As I said, they have a lot of scales and that means they will, um, they will be good for color work because the color work will kind of melt together and they will also create a fabric 
that looks more uh, uniform. Um, when we talk about woolen yarns, I generally like to think of the ones that feel dry or the one that feel, um, how should I say, uh, shiny. So the ones that feel dry and look shiny. Yeah. Um, and as an example, I have the Gotland yarn. So this is uh, the yarn I have spun for my parents' sheep. Um, they're from the Gotland breed. And the Gotland yarn is very, has this kind of sheen to it. I don't know if you can get a feel for it. Um, and it has a lot of, uh, again, these long stables that some people find itchy. Uh, but it also gives us a very beautiful halo, um, almost like a halo, like if you add mohair. Um, this yarn will not give you that. It will give you like a very smooth fabric um, and it's less itchy. So this one is one I will mention when I talk about something that feels more dry. But actually the most dry feeling for me is, let me get it. Uh, this one is a perfect example. This is a German Merino. Uh, it's um, the rain cloud and sage yarn, the homestead base, and this feels so dry. It's the same kind of very plump um, yarn that has, it doesn't have these long staples that you can find itchy, but it's very dry compared to the, um, the Gotland yarn uh, that is also, that is more shiny and doesn't feel so dry when you touch it. Yeah, it's hard to explain a little bit, but these are the things you can find in yarns. These are both woolen spun and both non superwash and uh, but they have these different, um, yeah, uh, qualities. That's the word I'm looking for. So with this kind of Gotland yarn, you will get more sheen to your fabric. With a kind of very dry, bouncy yarn like this, you will have a very, um, not flat, but it, it won't reflect light. So it will look more, uh, yeah, I don't know what is the word I'm looking for, but it doesn't reflect light like the shiny one. It just looks more matte, matte. That's the word, matte. Um, yes, so I don't know if you can see the sheen a little bit more here compared to this one that has no sheen. Um, so rustic wool comes in many shapes and forms. I can also show you again the plotolobi, which is an unspun and you can really get to see all these long, fibers sticking out, um, they are the ones we normally find itchy. But this is one of my favorite yarns to use for children. I make some, I I always ask my mom to make them because I uh, don't always make all the clothes. But the Plotolopi is perfect for a sweater for children. Excuse me, it's super lightweight. It's wonderful and yeah, you, I don't find it itchy at all and it regulates the temperature beautifully. It um, it lets in air or keeps them warm. Uh, again, you want to keep in mind if um, it's gonna, the child is gonna wear it with long sleeves under or not. So always with the more rusty yarns, I recommend having not too much skin contact, at least for me. You can also find wool that is not very itchy, that seems very soft, but that is still just 100% wool. Like this um, Knitting for Olive Double Merino that I showed you before. It's a blow yarn, which means they blow this very soft merino into a tube again of merino. Um, and it's just so soft. No one will ever find this itchy. I don't think so. And for example, the Sunday yarn I showed you before, it's also very soft feeling. Again, it's just wool. So depending on the way it's spun and the kind of wool, if you use a very fine merino, it is very fine and much softer than if you use, um, let's say, a Gotland or an Icelandic sheep, which are not bred to have um, a very fine fleece. Uh, that's a whole talk about microns and softness of wool, and I won't go into that now. But yeah, that's also very interesting. Let's move into the next section that is... Uh, all the, um, the other animals, let's say, so alpaca and mohair and angora and silk. Um, if we start with alpaca, it's very popular. As you can see, it's a very drapey yarn. It's very 
loose. <laughs> um, that's one way you can kind of test. It also depends how hard the yarn is wound, but you can kind of test how drape your yarn is by looking at the skein. Um, yeah, so the alpaca is uh, very soft, but I actually find it itchy. And that's again because it generally has these long staples that kind of stick out and I find itchy. So to the touch, it's very soft, but when I wear it, it will create this uh, itchy feeling. Um, I knit one sweater in alpaca. It's very drapey. Uh, it's very nice, but there are different reasons why I don't necessarily love um, alpaca sweaters. This one hasn't... Um, so what can happen is it can grow out of shape. This one hasn't really grown out of shape. Um, but it is... Uh, I find it a bit itchy. And the other thing is, I don't think the stitch definition is as nice as I like it. For some reason, I find that the alpaca it doesn't grab, grip onto uh, itself in the same way it doesn't have this grip. So it kind of uh, slides around more. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not the huge, biggest fan of alpaca, uh, although it's a beautiful fiber. I know some people really love it, so that all depends. Uh, on your personal preferences um, so I'm not gonna talk too much more about alpaca um, I have some I don't have any silk silk pure silk yarns but I have for example this yarn which is Samite uh, from Blacker Yarns um, oh, from Blacker Yarns it is uh, a silk blend so wool and silk blend and it gives the yarn something different. In this case, it gets a little more nippy. It has these little nips uh, of silk, like almost a tweedy effect. Um, and yeah, it just has a different feel to it and a different drape. I, um, we all know the silk mohair. It is very popular to hold together with other yarns. Um, for example, here you can see I held it together with the Sneldan with two different colors and I think one of the things that is so much fun with the mohair is you can kind of color a white or gray yarn uh, with a different color. So here I used like a rosy color and here I used the taupe and it gives you two different kinds of fabric. Um, so holding mohair together with a woolen yarn will give you the benefits of the wool and also little more of this soft fluffy texture as you can see here yeah so that is normally what i use silk mohair for it's just to add in some color uh, add in maybe a little bit of uh, different texture to the yarn um, then i have another yarn to show you uh, which is uh, uh, also has silk and this is the silk merino yak blend um, from Anita's World uh, and this is some of the most sleek yarn and shiny yarn I think I've ever worked with. I will show you one more that's more sleek and shiny uh, and has a beautiful stitch definition. Um, yeah, and this is a non-superwash. I think everything I'm going to show you is non-superwash so I'm never mentioning it. Um, I tend to like uh, other to use wool that has been blended with other yarns. I find that works the best for my liking. Uh, so you get the benefits from the wool and you can blend in silk to make it softer or sh shinier. You can blend in, um, for example, yak is very soft and so on. So blends can be really a nice way to, um, to get a different, uh, yeah, to get different uh, benefits from different kind of fibers. Uh, you can also blend yarns yourself. That is what you do when you hold two strands together or three strands or more strands, but it will always be separated. So if I hold mohair with something else, you will always see the strand of mohair instead if it was mixed before spinning, it would look different. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you do it yourself. Um, yeah, let's move on to plant fibers and I have only a few to show you. I um, This one, for example, is uh, a cotton merino blend uh, that I'm wearing um, for knitting from Knitting for Olive. Uh, cotton can be a little hard to work with. Uh, I don't have any cotton here, but you 
all know what cotton yarn looks like, I think, can be a bit hard to work with for the hands because it doesn't have a lot of, um, of elasticity. And that is why sometimes it's nice to pick a blend when you want to work with cotton yarns, um, just to have something that is a little more uh, easy to work with and has, let's say, the benefit from wool and cotton at the same time. So plant fibers are generally work used for summer garments because they are more cool and um, I think the knitted fabrics can be so beautiful for example linen here I have a lino mucha um, this linen is very thin as you can see it's a very thin yarn you can hold it double or single but it um, I find it very hard to work with for my hands because again it has no like cotton has no stretch nothing now you can see my face like with cotton yarn, it has no stretch at all, which means it is, um, it's a little unpleasant to work with for me. But I think the fabric you have in the end is so perfect for summer. It's light, it's drapey, and it's, um, it's cool. So different from the wool, it keeps you cool more. Uh, I can also show you another one. This is the most sleek yarn I've ever worked with. This is a tensile yarn. Uh, tensile is made from uh, lyocell uh, and this is extremely sleek it is just shiny and sleek uh, it bounces off the light um, and I also don't really enjoy working with this so much because it is just this is one is slipping out of my hands instead it's still not bouncy and it's slipping out of my hands so you really have to keep in mind when picking yarn also how if you like to work with it um, but there are many beautiful uh, plant fibers you can work with and i'm sure some people like working with them uh, and i will keep trying because i really like the finished result so that's um, something to think about the last yarn i would like to mention is acrylic yarn i really don't use acrylic yarn anymore but I did use acrylic yarn when I started knitting because I didn't know much about yarns and fiber content and didn't think much about it. I pretty much looked, do I like how it looks? And is it cheap? So I have some, um, I have this sweater that is huge uh, and I really like it. It was one of the first big projects I made. It is a all cable sweater. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the yarn. This is knit from a uh, yarn from Fildar. Um, it's called Fildarredone, something like that. I will put it down below. Um, this yarn is 40% uh, acrylic. And it is, uh, oh, I don't remember, 60% acrylic, 40% wool, and 50% acrylic, 40% wool, I think. And some alpaca, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. And it is there are several things to this because it's also super wash. It's very heavy. Um, it's a very heavy yarn. I don't know if that's because of the acrylic or the what it is. I imagine if I made this today, I would pick a woolen spun uh, tweed yarn, just like very similar to this, but it would be so light and airy. And this yarn is not light and airy. This sweater is always sliding off my shoulders. Although I like it, it's a big grandpa sweater. It just keeps falling off because of the, I think the fiber content or the treatment. It's just a heavy, heavy thing. So I used to use uh, acrylic yarns without thinking too much about it, but I don't anymore. Acrylic yarn is not breathable. And so it's not something, and plus it's not for me. Um, something I want to support so um, I just wanted to mention that because I think this sweater would be beautiful in a more woolly light yarn so it wouldn't be so heavy and pulling me down I'm, I hope you're still here <laughs> this is a long episode the next section is things to consider when picking a yarn for a project now apart from everything I've mentioned you also really have to consider will this yarn work for this project um, i'm going to show you some fails and some non fails i guess uh, i think i've become much better at this for example i knit this uh skullmaker sweater that is my own design in this beautiful tweed yarn from retrosaria uh, rosa pomar shop in um, 
in Lisbon. And this yeah, this yoke, it's a yoke sweater with the texture. It's so hard to see in this yarn. I don't know if you can even tell what is going on. Because the yarn is very tweedy, very beautiful. It's a soft, the soft Donegal. But it just it just kills the the, the textured pattern. It it just I think it's beautiful in person, but if you want to show it off for pictures, for example, which one of the things I always have to keep in mind, it's just not showing. And all the work you put into it, it's a bit of a pity that the that the textures are kind of lost in the busy busyness of the of the tweed. I made another tweed sweater because I really like tweedy yarns. Uh, this is in the beautiful Uist wool, uh, Uist wool um, and the Kanach. And here you can see this is a cardigan. And this one uses uh, a tweed yarn, but it doesn't kill the little detail. This is the tiny detail that you see. But the rest of the sweater is very simple and the yarn gets to shine. All you get to see is the beautiful tweed um, and it doesn't take over the details. So these are kind of two examples of one type of yarn, like tweed yarn, it's not always good for everything. Um, even if I like tweed yarns, I, I stop using it a little bit or I'm more thoughtful of when I use it because it doesn't work for a huge array of things. Uh, but it's beautiful for, for example, a cable sweater because cables are kind of popping out. If you look on the uh, this one, you will notice that the bubbles are more visible, but not so much the the finer details, the textured detail. Um, so you have to really think if it's a cable sweater with a lot of thick cables that kind of pops out of the knitting, they will be visible. But more small, subtle details, uh, maybe if there's knit pearl details, they kind of disappear. Maybe you want them to kind of disappear. Maybe you like that it's more blendy, but that's something you have to keep in mind. Another thing uh, to keep in mind, uh, and here I have a sweater that I never wear, and it's a beautiful sweater, always hairs on my stuff, uh, but I pretty much never wear it. That is due to different things, but one of them is the yarn choice. Um, the other one is the construction, but I talked a lot about that in other episodes. Uh, this yarn is a very beautiful hand-dyed yarn, and I always fall in love with beautiful hand-dyed yarn, but it's super wash and I really dislike, I sweat in this sweater so much. <laughs> and it has three quarter length sleeves, so it's something I can only wear when it's a little bit warmer, like spring and fall, and I just end up sweating in it every time I wear this. It's not regulating my temperature because of the coating uh, of the yarn. So yeah, I kind of suffocate in the sweater, um, so I never wear it. So that is also why I don't work with superwash yarns, because for me, I don't like the feeling of the, um, how I can breathe in them. Another thing to consider is if you want to substitute yarn. If you buy a pattern, normally there's a recommended yarn or one or two kinds, um, and you can easily substitute that yarn. You have to keep the yardage in mind, um, the weight and the gauge. But once you're over that, um, you can kind of pick and choose and it can be really difficult what yarn will work then what I recommend doing is always go to a pattern, uh, the pattern page on Ravelry and look in the projects you will find those in the right side there will always be uh, projects for the pattern and projects for the yarn um, so you can go and click on the pattern projects some patterns of course don't have many but then you can um, see what yarns the testers used or other people have used. The other thing you can do is if you find a yarn you think will work, then go, as I said, and look at projects made with that yarn and see if something similar has been made with a similar texture or with a similar, um, yeah, if it's color work, does it look good with color work? Uh, the texture, does that look good? These techniques that the sweater uses, um, does it work? Does it have drape? Doesn't it have drape? Um, so Ravelry is really your friend if you want to go and have an idea if something 
works or not. I use Ravelry all the time because I buy a lot of yarn online um, and it makes it really hard to get that sense of the yarn. Uh, and then the other tip would be to just maybe buy one skein and try to see if you like it before you buy a full <laughs> sweater's quantity because it can really be hard also with the colors. But colors is a whole nother thing that I cannot really cover in this episode. I will say my trick to working with different yarns is I try to have more projects going at the same time. So maybe I am working a project with uh, this kind of yarn that is super soft and fun to work with. Or I work um, with uh, this yarn that is very sleek but can be a little bit tiring for my hands as I have to grab a little bit harder onto the yarn to get the same tension. But then at the same time, then I would pick something like uh, the Plotolopi, which is a totally different experience. So I like to have different projects going at the same time that kind of gives, is different, has a different feel for my hand. The same as I like to have a more complicated project and a more easy project, which is more stuck in that stitch. I like to work on a project with like a sock on small needles, but also a sweater on bigger needles. So I can always change back and forth and I never get too tired of uh, a specific type of yarn, a specific project. That's my best advice to avoid too much fatigue when working with a specific yarn. Um, yeah, but generally I really like the more rustic woolen yarns they make me happy i think they feel the best in the hands they are the most forgiving when you knit uh, they kind of melt together blend together beautifully um, but really different yarns have different qualities and i try to always be very mindful about what i pick um, for my projects the last topic of this video is ethical choice so what are my thoughts about picking a yarn but from an ethical point of view as you have heard, I don't really like superwash yarns and that comes very much down to the fact that superwash is a chemical process and it makes a lot of um, waste uh, that is not good for the environment. So I really don't like that. Um, I think wool has beautiful properties and there's no need to coat it just to make it easier for, for us to wash it. Generally, I don't wash my garments very often. That might sound disgusting, but I don't. I wash them by hand, uh, maybe a few times a year. If it's a sweater or a shawl, I can hang them outside to air in the when, especially in the winter. And I tend to give my woolens a wash in the spring or summer when it's nice and uh, they dry faster outside. Um, yeah, so I don't. For me, it's not necessary to have superwash yarns. Um, you can read much more about the process, why it's not good for the environment. I will leave some blog posts down below. Uh, and yeah, that is one thing I really try to keep in mind. You can, to pick more sustainable yarns, you can always look for organic yarns. That's a way to know that the food they ate was organically grown, which means the fields were not uh, uh, like sprayed with pesticides. Uh, and it also normally gives you an uh, um, gives you some kind of uh, security for the welfare of the animal. Sheep in general have it easy; they they are kept outside. So if you try to buy from, for example, small flocks um, like local farm yarns, you know that the animals had a good life. Um, you can also look for that the label said says that the yarn is not. Uh, I always say it wrong. Mule, mules, mules? I don't know why that's so hard for me to say. You want to look for a yarn that is mule sling free. Um, and as you can see, this yarn is organic. It has a little organic label. Um, of course, it's easy to say something is organic and you want to try to see if they have some kind of um, label. You can also look for the Ecotex standard. Now I'm not gonna go into uh, what all these labels mean, but you can always look them up. Um, because some of them are more about the production, some have more to do also with the animals, uh, how they're treated. Um, here is also another little uh, organic yarn, and you can see it has different labels telling you about how the process was. This is uh, a gardener. Um, and lastly, you can also choose uh, upcycled wools, 
like uh, this one, which is 100% upcycle from uh, Black Hill Organocell, which means the yarn has been uh, repurposed uh, from other spinnings. And, um, or you can take an old sweater and rip it back and create a new sweater with that yarn. Um, it can be a starboard sweater, I've done that before. And if you look at the content, so you want to try to pick some good yarn. If it's, I did one that was a wool and silk and it, the yarn was beautiful and I could use it again. Um, so you can do different things to be uh, more mindful of how the yarn has been made. Again, if you want to be really sure, you just go for a farm yarn that you know it's from this farm um, and that you know how the animals were kept. Uh, and again, in different countries, they have different laws for organic and so on. So I cannot go into that uh, too much. But for me, generally, it's important that not only the animal was treated well, but also the way the farm is run is not harming the environment. Um, yeah, and then there are some fibers that are more sustainable than others. Cotton is not the most sustainable fiber. Linen is more sustainable and wool, again, wool is a product you have to take it off the animal uh, to help them. Um, I make yarn from my parents' sheep and that yarn is the sheep are sheared twice a year for them to uh, stay happy and not overheat in the summer and, um, and so on. For me, when we talk about sustainable yarn, the important thing is to keep in mind that we are not, it doesn't have to be fanatic. We don't need to be perfect. I generally buy all my food organic, but sometimes I cannot get this thing and I buy it not organic. Or sometimes I buy it produced in Denmark because buying the same product organic, uh, I might have to buy it from Argentina, which is not really sustainable in my uh, eyes so you always have to kind of keep your own uh, preferences in mind and yes sometimes I sit and drool over a nice uh, superwash hand dyed yarn because they make beautiful yarns and it is very tempting but I don't feel so good about this superwash process when I can have yarn that is not superwash process um, if that doesn't bother you then I'm not judging you. I'm just saying these are my reasons for always talking about that. For me, it's all about being mindful, trying to think in the big picture. It doesn't matter if one time you use a non superwash yarn, that's not what's gonna change the world. But if you try to generally in your everyday think about how, where your yarn comes from and these, where your yarn comes from and how it's produced, I think it makes a difference. Well, that was it for this uh, huge episode. I hope you're still here. If it's way too long, I feel like I've been talking forever. I might chop it up into some sections, but um, if I can keep it as one, I would really like that. I want to say that you really have to think about, in the end, the yarn you choose, when you think about all the specifics, the weights and the gauge and everything, think about if this yarn suits your lifestyle. Think about if you will, the garment you will have, will that work with how you live? Because I, for example, work from home. I can wear all the woolen sweaters. Sometimes my house is a bit cold and I need to wear something big and warm. But if you work in an office or something else, it might not suit your lifestyle. So try to think about who are you and what do you need and how will that work with the yarn? There's so many yarns out there and so many choices, but you kind of have to hone in on what works for you and what will make you happy. Um, I hope to make another episode uh, talking about uh, style and colors because um, I think that's also a very important, uh, important aspect in making a sustainable wardrobe that suits you, that makes you happy. Um, yeah, and I really hope you found this video helpful and it uh, can help you make the choice easier or maybe I just made it much harder um, I want to say if you enjoy this video uh, and if you enjoy my content in general you can always go over to coffee I have a link below and buy me a little coffee uh, I don't use it for coffee but that is a way you can support me and the work I do and uh, other than that, you can find me on Instagram, on Ravelry, and everything is Fiber Tales. I would love to see you there. 
And to keep this conversation going, you can go to my Ravelry group. I have a thread for my videos and I think that's the perfect place where we can keep talking. Of course, also in the comments down below, but um, maybe for a little more of this a discussion, I would love to see over in the Ravelry group um, to talk a little bit more. I will talk to you all very soon. Take care. Bye.